if you starve them, they become very protected against chemotherapy, but the cancer cells will actually become sensitized. So this was really a powerful um, finding. I don't know how much new you know about um, my work. It's just kind of serendipitous that your assistant reached out to me, but I'm very well uh, versed in your research. So this is going to be super exciting for me. Um, oh, good. Yeah, and congrats on uh, on your book. Thanks, thanks. Yeah. So I guess to begin, why don't we start, um, if you can, just tell me your background. How did you get uh, interested initially in this line of research? Um, that's pretty much all I've ever done. Um, I was a music student um, back in college in Texas. And, um, and then uh, I decided to, um, I mean, uh, it was, um, they asked me to uh, direct a marching band. And there was the time where I decided that I didn't want to do that anymore. And I was a rock musician. And, and aging actually was the, um, what came to, my, uh, to me first. And I was, I don't know, I was just very interested in uh, scientifically. But I also thought that it was uh, a, uh, a big uh, medical question or, or certainly one of the best ways to address medical issues. Um, so, yeah, I was pretty sure from the very beginning, and that's all I've ever done uh, since then. And then, you know, I took all the, I mean, my goal was really not about making scientific discoveries, was more, how do I get people to, to be 110 healthy? Um, and the science and the medicine all came as a consequence of that. Of course, um, I, I, uh, the, the research we did reached all kinds of, uh, corners or edges and going from very basic to clinical trial to studies of population to centenarian studies to uh, genetic studies in humans and in simple systems etc cetera, etc cetera. it's very interesting just to uh i'm just curious you know where did your early existential leanings stem from i mean why did you become at such a young age interested in aging usually you know my my work is a lot about neurodegenerative disease and how to engage young people around preventing things like Alzheimer's and dementia, which begin in the brain decades, as you know, before the first symptom. But I find that it's kind of a hard sell for young people. So why did you, at such a young age, become interested in, in aging? Yeah, I don't know. But I suspect, uh, I mean, this is something that I talk about in the book, you know, even though it's cliche, uh, that, uh, you know, the fact that I was in, in the room when my grandfather died, I wasn't supposed to be, but I was. And I think, you know, I was five years old or something like that. And, and probably that was in my head very uh, clearly, right? In like uh, like 9-11, you know, you, you have those events that, you know, you might, not remember, you might not think about it all the time, but they're in your head all the time. And, um, and so I think that maybe I always wanted to figure out why did he die when when I was so young, and uh, I think he also died uh, decades before he had to. I mean, he only had that hernia, and that, you know, because it, it was left untreated, ended up killing him uh, way before uh, his time. And, um, and in fact, in the book, I talk about how his neighbor, Salvatore Caruso, uh, made it to 110 and one of the oldest people in the world. Um, and, uh, you know, they were eating the same food, doing all the uh, right things. But uh, my grandfather just uh, decided not to uh, not to get an operation. Mm. And that was enough to may maybe shorten his life by 40, 50 years. Wow. Sorry to hear that. Um, so what were some of your earliest studies that really uh, clued you in to the notion that with your interventions, you might have an impact on this process that, you know, since the dawn of medicine was sort of considered to be something we could do little to change. Right. Well, the, the original studies, I, I was uh, lucky enough to have some great mentors, and one of them was Roy Walford, who was at the time, back in the early 90s, was one of the gurus, probably the world-leading uh, figure in nutrition and aging. And, um, and uh, you know, when I was working with Roy, I was, um, he was actually in, in a place called Biosphere 2, and himself and other seven people had locked themselves up in this uh, place in Arizona, uh, in the middle of the desert, and they did the first human experiment on calorie restriction. So, mm -hmm. now what happens if you feed people a lot less calories all the time? You know, of course, they become very thin, 
and very angry. And uh, but they also have remarkable benefits, you know, whether it's cholesterol, blood pressure. You know. So that was my early exposure uh, to this world, and um, so to the good and the bad, you know. So in in one sense, I thought amazing. Look at the the effect on on blood pressure. They had blood pressure of like eighty five over fifty five. Wow. And cholesterol was extremely low, and anyway, everything was was incredible. Uh, and yet they looked terrible, you know. And huh. and so, and so I thought, well, I think. Uh, and I, we we were doing experiments in Walford Lab and mice and and people, but I thought, well, I need to go back to bacteria, and and uh, yeast and simple organisms to figure out uh, the the fundamentals. And, uh, and that was the right track. I mean, several of us uh, in different laboratories took a chance on this because, of course, if you start, if you go from humans, as I was doing, and everybody working on humans and mice thought everything else is just worthless, you know. And, uh, and so moving to bacteria, it seemed like a crazy idea. How are you going to possibly figure out how, how people age by studying bacteria or yeast? Uh, but it turned out to be the right move, and so we were able to identify some of the key genes that regulate longevity, the Taurus cis pathway, the PKA pathway. Others identify the IGF-1 uh, growth hormone pathway, and um, you know. But that was that was what I needed to then uh, uh, go back and, and and figure it out. And the other thing that was very er- uh, obvious early on was if I starve bacteria or I starve yeast, they live longer. And they were much stronger, r- protected. Uh, they had a shield against damage. Um, so that was very convincing to me. From a very, early, it was very counterintuitive. I said, "Well, why are you starving these these organisms? They live longer. I mean, completely starving them. For that's it. You know, you just switch them to water and you lift them there, and you figure that they should die. I mean, they should die a lot earlier, and be weaker. You know, and and so." And when I saw it in two organisms as far apart as bacteria and yeast, which of course is a eukaryote, I knew there was something to it. And uh, yeah, so that was that was then the focus has been on starvation from the very early uh, days. Wow. So these early trials, experiments that you ran with yeast, you, you would deprive them of food and sugar, and you found that their lifespans would dramatically increase. Yeah, yeast was <clears throat> the perfect model because it was... It was uh, had much more similarities than bacteria to, to humans, uh, to mice and humans. And, uh, and also, I mean, the, the level of the genetic understanding, the molecular biology understanding back then, it was just remarkable. You know, my, uh, at UCLA, we had so many people working on yeast and, and having all kinds of mutants that, um, including mutants uh, uh, that had uh, defects in the sugar pathway, in the in the, the RAS PKA pathway. So it was uh, the, the perfect system to understand the, for, in understanding why fasting makes an organism live longer and understanding which genes are involved. You know, So really rapidly, it only took me like six months a year to identify the genes because there was just so much work that was done in yeast. I mean, nobody really cared about aging, but, uh, but so much molecular biology and genetics that um, it was uh, just a uh, ideal system to to figure it out. Yeah. Fascinating. And then, so what? The next step was then to take those findings and apply them to mice. Uh, yeah. Eventually, then um, I, I applied them to mice and and human cells. And and of course, the the focus was always on the conservation. You know, what are some of the fundamental connection between nutrients and genes and protection? And eventually. The first thing was applied to cancer, uh, and the and the reason for that was that uh, the um, so if you starve yeast, they become protected, but then if you introduce an oncogene like mutation, so if you make them a little bit like cancer cells, um, then they're no longer protected. So mm-hmm. we knew that the oncogenes were controlling the protection, and so from there was the idea what I call differential stress resistance, um, which is. Uh, protect the normal cells instead of the cancer cells, right? And, and we, we, which we call the magic shield to sort of hmm. go against the magic bullet idea of cancer treatment, right? And, um, and so it worked very well, you know, so we could show that yeast and mice, if you starve them, they become very protected against chemotherapy, but the cancer cells, 
will actually become sensitized to chemotherapy hmm. by the fasting, right? So this was really a powerful um, finding, and um, and then you know from there, then we moved to uh, many more studies in mice, and then eventually humans. Yeah, so just making the leap from cancer to autoimmunity. I think the first time I became aware of your work was uh, about 2014 when. Headlines were made that, you know, a three-day fast could regenerate the immune system, essentially, were what the headlines said, and those headlines, you know, went viral. Um, could you talk to me a little bit about those findings? Because I often get asked a lot of questions about autoimmunity. There seems to be a lot of autoimmunity going on these days, so it's a very relevant, yeah. relevant topic. Yeah, and by the way, then we, we publish a follow-up paper on multiple sclerosis, uh, and then one on type 1 diabetes, although the type 1 diabetes model was not an autoimmune one, but the, the multiple sclerosis was. And, um, yeah, so the basically uh, during starvation uh, condition, during fasting, the, the immune system, um, uh, there is a major lowering of white blood cells, um, and, uh, and there is also an activation of the hematopoietic stem cells in the bone marrow particularly. And then when you refeed this... Uh, uh, stem cells in the bone marrow give rise to new uh, white blood cells. And mm. so essentially, in, during the starvation, you kill a lot of the damaged immune cells, including the autoimmune ones, or specifically the autoimmune ones, and, uh, or particularly the autoimmune ones. And then during the refeeding, you generate new cells that are no longer autoimmune. And if you keep doing this, and in the EMS model, we were able to uh, demonstrate this. Uh, so... We, we, de- we do doing transplant of splenocytes, basically uh, immune cells from one mouse to the other, we were able to show that it's not so much that the fasting blocks the generation of autoimmunity, is that the fasting specifically kills autoimmune cells and replaces mm. them with cells that are not autoimmune. So we could get maybe about a, a 20% of mice that would be completely free of the disease symptoms, and then about 50% of the mice that were doing much, much better, almost... Uh, back to normal levels, uh, but overall it, it helped all the, all the mice. And then we did a clinical trial, um, per, a pilot one, a preliminary one with uh, 60 patients, and they also, uh, at least the preliminary data suggested that uh, this could be protective. Of course now uh, we're doing a multi-center trial and that's uh, in combination with standard of care drugs. Wow, so those patients so, had MS, those human patients. Yeah, and if I recall, they also showed an increase in you know quality of life, and um, but again, very early, but hopeful nonetheless. Right, right, yeah. yeah. So yeah. between the mouse and the preliminary uh, human work is very uh, is very uh, awful, and um, yeah, we'll see now in the uh, in the clinical trials. But you know, the possibility. I mean, ob- obviously, the ideal would be if it works for everybody. But even if it worked with a, a subset of people, say a percentage of people or, or MS patients that have a, a particular that are a particular stage of the disease, that would be uh, very very important, and uh, and it could make a tremendous difference for for that portion of patients. It's interesting the the fact that there was a cyclical aspect to the fasting and feeding that, and both were distinctly helpful in the case of uh, reducing autoimmunity. You've got the fasting to kill off the autoimmune cells, and then you've got the feeding, which really spurs the growth or the creation of new immune cells. Is that, did that in- inform the fasting mimicking diet that you created in, in humans? Yeah, I mean, I think what informed is, is the understanding of mechanisms, right? Yeah. I, I mean, uh, so once you start to figure out that the refeeding is as important as the fasting. Uh, and then, you know, the timing is very important and the content is very important. It really is starting to get a very, uh, an in-depth understanding of what's going on. And, and then you can use it to your advantage. Um, I mean, unfortunately, I think back in the days with calorie restriction, um, chronic calorie restriction, of course, they didn't have the refeeding. And, um, you know, and that was probably one of the, the major problems with it. This is why, in the end, it doesn't really have much of an effect on, on longevity because you you have so many positive effects of calorie restriction, but probably also so many negative effects. Hmm. And um, and so the idea with the fasting mimicking diet now is 
um, let's nourish the patient, prevent problems like hypotension, hyper, hyper, hypoglycemia, et cetera, uh, promote the destruction of damaged cells, but also of intracellular components through autophagy. Hmm. We know that autophagy, I mean, we haven't uh, started publishing on that yet, but certainly that's something that we clearly happens very, very powerfully uh, after, during fasting. So then you destroy cellular and intracellular components, turn on the stem cells, but also turn on the mechanism inside of a cell to rebuild and rebuild intracellularly and cellularly um, and during the refeeding. Uh, yeah, so this is, um, this is the power of this. And, um, you know, I think that the most striking example is our diabetes paper, type 1 diabetes paper, where we show, you know, in the pancreas that you can almost completely destroy the beta cells of the pancreas. And then you start the cycles of, of fasting, mimicking diet, and refeeding. And you see the, the insulin generation going back to normal um, and, the, and the glucose coming back to uh, almost normal levels. So, um, so it's very powerful in, in activating a, what I call an embryonic-like uh, uh, um, program. Uh, if you look at the genes that are expressed, are very similar to the genes that you see expressed during uh, embryonic development and fetal development, right? So there's not too many things that have that kind of ability to turn back on embryonic developmental programs. That's incredible. Has that been... Did you show that in humans with type 1 diabetes, the regeneration of pancreatic beta cells? No, no. Not, not in humans yet. Not in humans but, yet, okay. Uh, but we showed it with human cells. So this was mice and human cells from both uh, normal subjects and beta cells from uh, type 1 diabetes patients. And we could show even the beta cells from type 1 diabetes patients that we can turn back on the insulin production. Okay. Uh, so that's very promising. Of course, you know, it's, the clinical trial... We haven't done yet. I think uh, a group in Austria is doing it now. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Very promising. Um, and I, I also really appreciate the, um, you know, the the fact that a lot of people in nutrition these days like to think in black or white terms. You know, that carbs are good or carbs are bad. That high protein is good. High protein is bad. And I think that the yin and yang nature of you know, cyclical feeding and fasting is very uh, important. And it's a nuance that I think is very frequently lost today in the buzz surrounding fasting like diets. So, could you... yeah. Um... Yeah, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. So, there is both uh, big complaints on, on the everyday, and the book talks about that on the everyday diet, but also on this uh, fasting craze that where, you know, the words like intermittent fasting are used to define everything and everything in between, uh, you know. So you're now talking about a two-hour not eating, a 10-hour not eating, and a 20-day, and, and all put together in the same intermittent fasting. Of course, that's silly. Um, you know, there is some of it that for certain purposes is not even fasting at all, right? So... If you eat 500 calories uh, and twice a week, you're not fasting. You know, you have glycogen reserves that last at least 12 hours. It takes about 30 hours to completely digest your food. So you're not fasting if you if you eat 500 calories on one day and the day after you're you're eating normal. I mean, of course, you're fasting because even if you don't eat for 30 minutes, you're fasting, right? I mean, so so you're not eating, but. I think when we talk about the word fasting, most people have in mind, you know, ketogenesis, have in mind, uh, you know, fat breakdown, have in mind uh, um, all kinds of changes that we and others have described. And, and those really don't occur until a couple of days into it. A couple of days. So what about the notion that some people wake up, you know, if you're in a, par you know, even a partially glycogen depleted state, you can wake up in mild ketosis. Um, yeah, you you can you can uh, um, probably have uh, some effects on on uh, ketones and ketone bodies. You really don't see that because a lot of the times when we measure, uh, even after one day, sometimes even after three or four days, the ketone bodies are still relatively low. And this is why you know we go five days because by five days most people are in a full uh, ketogenesis mode, and um, uh, so yeah, it. Uh, 
uh, you know, you can have ketone bodies go up at, at any time. But I mean, we're really talking about, um, I mean, people always ask me about ketone bodies and, and nobody's ever demonstrated that ketone bodies themselves are any good to you, you know? Uh, so, so it, the ketone body should be more of a marker to show that you've entered, like we use it, that you have entered a full starvation response state, you know? So we use four markers is IGF-1, IGF-BP-1, glucose and ketone bodies. Uh, and nothing else. You know? It's not like because you achieve a higher level or a mid level or a low level of ketone bodies that you all of a sudden know that you're going to have an effect. The effect you really get with this coordinated uh, response that I described earlier, where you know you want to get rid of bad cells, get rid of bad cellular component, and replace them with new ones. Kind of like taking the car to the shop hmm. and uh, you know get rid of. Uh, uh, the tires, if they're they're worn out, and even the engine, if it's worn out, and replace it, and uh, that that's what can make a tremendous difference. Here. So, talk to me before we get into the longevity diet book, which is great. Um, what? How did you come up with the protocol for the fasting mimicking diet, and what is it? What is the what does that protocol look like for people that want to attempt it? Macronutrient composition. I mean, how did you design it? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the fasting making diet is really uh, what I call out of what I call nutri technology, which is different from um, uh, what a lot of other people are doing with uh, functional foods, etc. I mean, nutri technology is more about like if you take all foods that you eat, can you uh, alter the composition, the relative composition, so that you trigger different responses? You know, so you can have particularly with macronutrients, but also micronutrients, can you have a certain formulation so that you can control TOR, can control PKA, IGF-1, et cetera, et cetera. And um, yeah, so that's where the fasting making diet comes from. You know, understanding all these connections, then you say, oh, if I put this and this and this, and then I lower that, and then I put this, and that's, you know, uh, what it is. Uh, that also tells you how complicated uh, it is to do this at home. So, in broad strokes, what does it what does it look like? It's a it's every month you take five days. No, no, not every month. Uh, um, this is in the clinical trial we did uh, once a month for three months, uh, but there was just, just a clinical trial. I mean, we okay. think that most people probably do it uh, sh- should do it maybe once every four months. Okay, so that would be the average once every four months uh, for somebody that may have, let's say, one of the risk factors for diseases out of whack or out of uh, range, right? So let's say high, high cholesterol, probably once every four months, three to four months. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're perfectly healthy, maybe once every six months, if you have a ideal everyday diet, uh, you exercise, etc. cetera. Um, but if you're obese and you have high cholesterol, high blood pressure, uh, then you you need to do it once a month until uh, you move to uh, to a better uh, state. And it's essentially a high fat, low protein. It's a high fat, certain type of fats, not just fat. Okay. Good fats, high good fats, low protein, certain kind of proteins. What are the What are the good fats? What are the good proteins? Well, you know, the, the good fats are, you know, there's all kinds of nuts type in there. Uh, there's like five or six, there's olive oil, there's, you know, coconut. I mean, it is, it's all mixed. I mean, the way we did it at the beginning was first t- uh, tested in cells, then tested in mice, and then and then moved to people. Hmm. So some of it is counterintuitive. You know, you, you wouldn't think that that works. But, but so, you know, in this composition, it works very well. Uh, as clinically tested, so yeah, so these are the fats, and the uh, of course there's low sugar, uh, and a lot of most of the carbohydrates come from vegetables, and, le- and no, it's low in legumes. That is the big difference with the everyday diet. Hmm. So there's no legumes, it's vegetables, and um, and but it, it's also made, um, and that's one thing that sometimes we get criticized for is also made so the people will come back to it you know it. and that's also some, a feature of the book you know under everyday diet 
It's mm-hmm. pointless to say, you know, somebody just wrote to me today and said, well, isn't it better to separate carbohydrates and fats and for insulin sensitivity? And I said, you know, maybe it's better. I don't know there is that much data on it, but let's say that it's better. It doesn't matter, you know, because the effect is so small. And if you're going to have another rule, people are not going to do it, you know. And so it's better to, to have certain um, um, treats, in a, in, a, in a sense, and, and, and try to get as close as possible to what people can continue to do, even though you might lose some efficacy. That's okay, uh, because the main thing is keep the people on it. Uh, because if, if, if the great majority of diets that are very invasive, within a year, they'll fail. You gain everything back, and sometimes you gain more uh, back yeah. Not just in, in, in weight, but also in, in uh, health status, right? So, uh, yeah, so I think it, that's another thing about the, the fasting making diet. Make it so people uh, feel, come on, this is easy. Um, I, it, it, I can do it, maybe not all the time, but I can do it certainly every three or four months. In the book, The Longevity Diet, you debunk two things that I hate hearing in nutrition circles and on social media, you debunk the notion that everything should be consumed in moderation. And you debunk the often repeated dogma that to be healthy and to be fit, we need to eat five to six small meals per day. Yeah. Yeah, moderation, I I, I think is, um, you know, one of the biggest mistakes, like the Mediterranean diet, you know, there's another big mistake, right? I mean, we, we use these words that basically allow people to do whatever they want, right? The Mediterranean diet, you go to Italy now and you ask people, uh, or Greece, and say, well, you know what the Mediterranean diet is? I'd say, of course. And then you, you ask them, well, what is it? And nobody knows, right? <laughs> and, uh, and nobody understands what it is. And moderation is the same way, right? And this is why I, I put the example of, of uh, I asked my students, at USC, well, what do you think a bagel contains? You know, and you never get what it really contains, three, 400 calories. You always get 100 calories or something. So, you know, moderation doesn't mean anything because people uh, just don't know what food contains and, and don't really understand, uh, you know, what's, what's high, what's mid, what's low. And, and so it's pointless. I mean, um, and also the five or six meals a day um, uh, are, are, just a bad idea and and you know and let's say again maybe if you if somebody brought them to you right if, if, if you were in a hospital and somebody brought it to you it is possible i doubt it but it is possible that it has some benefits right uh but it doesn't work like that what the the reality is when you tell somebody eat five or six times a day they may be getting to 9 p.m and they say well i only ate three times today so i got two more you know and that's exactly what happens, you know, when, when you look at it, people are now eating for 15, 16 hours a day because they're thinking, hey, the doctor is telling me to eat five times a day. I'm only at three, so I got I to gotta keep doing it. And uh, A, and B, you now have five, six opportunities to overeat, you know. And it's so easy to think, again, you're having 100 calories and you have 300. And in and, and, and the book I talk about, if you make a mistake of 5% or 3% every meal, which is you know, impossible to regulate, by the end of the year, you might have you know, 5, 10 extra pounds. Hmm. And um, so it doesn't work. What, what, what does work is what a lot of centenarians used to do all the time, which is uh, you know, eat two meal, major meals a day plus breakfast. And, and if you gain weight, you go to one breakfast plus one meal a day and maybe a snack and that just pretty much you don't need an explanation to go along with it right this will maintain your weight where it needs to be um and for for the great majority of people because again it's 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 just a simple rule of course if you don't follow it you don't follow it but if you follow it, it it's just gonna uh, help you uh not overeat and stay, you know, adherence, again, sticking to the plan, less, you have less decision fatigue when you only need to eat two to three meals per day as opposed to five or six. It's, um, it's a very helpful construct, I think. I think it helps you in all senses. Now, one thing that surprises people that I say, you know, because again, going to this uh, intermittent fasting idea that, that doesn't mean anything, is that most people, even the experts, 
are not aware of two pieces of data, which is really shocking to me. One is that if you go above 12 hours a day of fasting, uh, you start seeing gallstone formation and gallstone operation going up uh, dramatically, hmm. uh, um, up to twofold if you start surpassing 14 hours. You know, you hear all this, this about you know fasting for 14, 16 hours, but you never hear anybody talk about hey, are you aware of this major increase in the risk of uh, developing gallbladder? And this is fairly common. This is not a minor uh, problem. And the other thing is multiple studies now are showing that skipping breakfast, which will also be associated in most cases for going with 14, 16 hours of fasting, increases cardiovascular disease and, and may also increase overall mortality. So uh, not, not decreases, it increases, right? So... Uh, and that's amazing how many people in the United States, all over the world, are now doing this long daily fast hmm. and are not aware of these two uh, major pieces of data, which will tell you, of course, time restricted feeding is good, but it should be between 12 and 13 hours. It shouldn't be anything above that. Uh, and it shouldn't be much below that either, right? So, uh, so you, you shouldn't eat more than 12, 13 hours a day at the most and so it's it's not that hard i mean most people do it 8 a.m 8 p.m that's it you know maybe 8 a.m 9 p.m okay that's a stretch uh but that you know it's it's it, between let's say 11 and 13 hours is ideal so then would the takeaway be for people that do like to practice intermittent fasting the most commonly used definition of it you know time restricted feeding would the takeaway advice then be to skew your feeding window earlier in the day so as not to miss a morning meal and if so how early yeah i mean of course uh, based on what i just said uh you shouldn't do it because it, it uh, at best you're gonna double or certainly have a major increase in your gallstone formation and um and uh but if you for whatever reason must go 14 16 hours then, um, you know, skipping dinner uh, is the best way to go. Got it. Very interesting. So skipping dinner and having breakfast. So you, you, you have to eat at uh, um, whatever, you know, 2 p.m., the latest meal, and then you can have breakfast at, uh, at 7 a.m. You know? Very interesting. And I'm not, I'm not sure if you, you know, and it's okay if you're not familiar with the, with the specifics on that, on that data, but... Do you know if that the increased risk for cardiovascular disease from skipping breakfast applies to people who are, like what population does that apply to? The metabolically healthy or specifically people who have metabolic syndrome? I think everybody, uh, everybody. Uh, this is uh, epidemiological data, I think for at least three or four different studies, hmm. uh, uh, all confirming it. So if, if people reporting not eating breakfast tend to do worse than uh, people that have breakfast. Um, and that's already a bad sign, not, not only for skipping breakfast, but for any long fast, because it may very well be that the question was never asked, did you skip dinner, right? Hmm. Uh, I don't think they asked that question, right? Well, what if they did ask the question? And maybe it's the same way, you know? Hmm. And people that, uh, that consistently skip dinner may have, I don't know, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying. So maybe they, somebody did ask that question, but I think that, there may not be a common question. I mean, breakfast, I think, is a, a more common question in these uh, questionnaires. Hmm. All right. So, you know, I'm pretty much out of questions, but, uh, you know, your book just came out. It's already a bestseller. Very exciting. Um, is there anything else that, you know, that we haven't covered that you want to mention about the book, what people can gain from it? I think it's, you know, the, the this burgeoning field of longevity research, anti-aging, it's... Uh, the most important thing there is at the end of the day. It's not just about looking better in a bathing suit. So for that reason alone, people should go out and rush to buy it. But is there anything that we didn't cover? Anything, you know? No, I mean, one thing that I start the book uh, with is the five pillars. And uh, I think that it's important, you know, you can pick whatever book you want, obviously. Uh, but I will encourage people to stop reading books that don't have a strong foundation in science and medicine, meaning that, you know, I call them one, one pillar books, right? You know, 
you, you go out and and you make that opinion the whole book and in the majority of books out there are in that category you have to ask the question you know if i look at epidemiological studies would this idea hold what if i look at centenarian studies you know what if i go around the world and ask the centenarian what do you eat uh, what if i look at clinical trials randomized clinical trials or finally what if i look at basic research focus on longevity you know whether it's in a mouse or in an organism does the theory that is in a book, would that uh, hold um, in, in that setting? You know, would, if you fed that particular diet to a mouse, will it live longer? You know? and, and these are very important uh, pillars because uh, they make the chance that in five years we you know, have another idea and, and change our mind much, much lower. You know, if, you, if, if the decisions are based on on, uh, on this, uh, I mean, five pillars. The, the last one I didn't mention is complex systems. I also look at cars and, and planes and, and basically say, you know, also use complex system as a, as a model to understand, uh, to identify a particular diet that uh, may, may be good or bad for you. Hmm. Yeah, I completely, completely agree. Too many people buy that diet book to achieve that one goal. And, you know, the, uh, many of these books are written with one goal in mind, which is well, weight loss. Yeah, the first, thing, the first thing people should do is, like, who wrote it, right? <laughs> uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, you wouldn't go get surgery. I mean, it's funny, right? Because the, the, the field of nutrition and longevity together, particularly, is extremely complicated, right? Um, and people would never go get knee surgery from somebody that did not get uh, you know, uh, certified as a surgeon and went to a very good school, right? The medical school. But yet, <laughs> when it comes to your entire life and maybe the chance of having a three or four fold increased chance of getting cancer or, or diabetes, et cetera, anybody that uh, just able to write it can, can get out there and people buy that book. You know, it's, you're right. It's, if you think it's, uh, it's really interesting, uh, or it's bizarre, right? That, um, you know, for everything else, uh, whether it's repairing your car or getting yeah. surgery, we go pick the people that have got the, the training and training and training. But when it comes to food and longevity, anybody can have an opinion. So I, I'm very unlucky because I picked the two fields where like opinion, uh, <laughs> longevity and aging and, and nutrition. Well, you know, I'm doing my part to uh, try to, you know, bring a, a voice of science and, and you know, um, really high quality data and information to people in a way that they can understand. Um, and I've been a fan of your work for a while, so. Uh, oh, that's great. What you're doing yeah, is great. And I think that's yeah. exactly what we need. People that understand it and they can filter and present it to people in a way that they can understand it, but also in a way that protects the audience. Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here and I'll see you there. Is 70% of our immune system is living inside the wall of our intestines. Now in the whole of the intestines, okay, that's where the bacteria are. So the bacteria talks to our immune system because they are literally roommates.